This morning, congestion pricing. Exactly what is it? Will it relieve gridlock? And how will it affect your drive in the city and your wallet? Plus, fighting a sexual war in the military. I was preyed upon and then raped by a superior officer. Now, from 42nd and 2nd, this is PIX11 News Close-Up with Marvin Scott. Good morning, everyone. The role of the military is to defend our country. But there are many in the military who are now engaged in a personal defense as well, a defense against a rising number of sexual assaults in the various branches of the military. Now, nowhere was that better dramatized than in the Senate chamber this past week when Senator Martha McSally, a former Air Force combat pilot, shared her heartbreaking story. I was preyed upon and then raped by a superior officer. Senator Martha McSally sharing her story of survival during a hearing on sexual assaults in the military. I blame myself. I was ashamed and confused. And I thought I was strong, but felt powerless. McSally was the first American woman to fly in combat. During her career with the Air Force, she rose to the rank of colonel before retiring. But she'd almost left the Air Force earlier because of her despair. Like many victims, I felt the system was raping me all over again. According to the Department of Defense, in 2017, the military received nearly 7,000 reports of sexual assault involving service members. But, but many victims so many suffer in silence. I didn't report being sexually assaulted. Like so many women and men, I didn't trust the system at the time. A recent Smithsonian poll found that about two-thirds of current and former female service members experienced sexual harassment or assault. Sexual assault in the military is still pervasive. Within the past decade, the Department of Defense has dedicated more resources to preventing unwanted sexual conduct, supporting survivors, and prosecuting sexual offenders. But more work needs to be done. I'm honored to be here and use my voice and unique experience to work on this mission and stop military sexual assault for good. I'm pleased to be joined now by a military veteran who currently serves as New York City's Commissioner of Veterans Services. Lori Sutton is a psychiatrist. She attained the rank of Brigadier General in the United States Army. So good to have you in with us. Thank you so much. Is what we heard from uh, Senator McSally, does it correspond to what you had heard or witnessed in your 30 years in the Army? Well, Martin, first of all, Marvin, first of all, thank you f for paying attention to this issue. I'd like to start at, by just praising Senator McSally for the courage to come forward and tell her story. Be because I think that this is an issue which the Department of Defense and the services have been wrestling with for years, as, as you know. Um, it certainly, uh, it, it certainly aligns, her story aligns with what uh, I witnessed and experienced and also as a commander saw happen within my chains of command. That is to say, uh, when a serious crime was committed, I saw on numerous occasions the, the convening authority dismiss it and re refuse mm -hmm. to let it go to prosecution. So there are issues within the culture, there are issues within the system. I take great um, hope in knowing that the, the number of folks who are coming forward to report on an unrestricted basis, that seems to be going up. But here's what worries me the most, Marvin. The recent report showing that in the service academies, there's been a 50% increase. This is the future mm -hmm. of our military. It is a national security issue. In your years in, in the Army and functioning as a psychiatrist, did, did some of the victims come to you tormented because they had to remain silent? Oh, yes. Certainly in my clinical work, that was the case. And as I advanced as a a senior leader in the Army, uh, and then certainly in the last three years when I worked with all of the services as the director of the Defense Centers of Excellence for Psychological Health and Traumatic Brain Injury. This was an important issue which, um, which surfaced time and time again. And you know, one of the things that we learned over the years, we didn't really understand the, the, the role of the predator. Mm. For many years, the assumption was that, you know, you've got 
uh, young men and women together, you've got hormones, you've got stuff that happens. But in recent years now, we have come to learn what it is that a predator does. We know that predators over a lifespan, on average, 300 assaults. We know that a closed system like the military is predator prone. Service members who join the military have been shown in studies to have had a higher rate of pre-service assault or with, rape. With this now coming to the service, would you attribute much of this to the, the culture of the Me Too movement? Well, I think, I think the Me Too movement has absolutely helped. I think that the military, because of its very role in our society as one of our most trusted institutions, that the line, uh, the light that has shown on the military and really spurred by S Senator Gillibrand and her work on this issue. But I will tell you, Marvin, the, the film, The Invisible War, which came out in 2012, did more than a hundred years of hearings of white papers, of testimonies, and I think this week's testimony from Senator McSally has now brought this issue back front and center. And I, I really welcome the chance to be part of this solution going forward because I'm very optimistic mm -hmm. about the military. Yes, very resistant to change. No institution blocks change like the military. And that's a good thing. Their mission, their core mission is to fight and win our country's wars. But when directed to do so, no institution is more successful at tackling change. Let me pick up on that because there's a quote here from former Defense Secretary Mattis. He said, it's nature, uh, by its nature, sexual assault is one of the most destructive factors in building a mission-focused military. It's a weapon of mass destruction. Rape is a weapon of mass destruction. Senator McSally said one of the reasons she didn't come forward, she didn't trust the system. Mm. That's a sad commentary. Well, that's the biggest issue. That's the, the, you know, the military, to do what we do in the military, it requires trust to have each other's back, to know that I'd take a bullet for you and you for me. But the corrosive impact of leaders, as Senator McSally described, her superior officer, and one of the... Well over half of those who have been assaulted report that they didn't report because it was either a friend of their commanding officer or it was their superior, him or herself. Now, sexual assault claims, they remain, they remain challenging to prosecute, yes. particularly in the military. Yes. Why? You know, it's, it's, a, it's very complex. There are many factors. It's one of the reasons why what Senator Gillibrand has proposed that came just a handful of votes a few years ago from being passed, I think it's time for that Military Justice Improvement Act again because these issues are so complex they require a legal trained military prosecutor to determine when there's sufficient evidence to move forward to prosecute and when there is not. Now, back in 2013, you were working with Senator Gillibrand yes. to try and change that system, to, to change the procedure. Instead of the commander handling rape and sexual assault cases, you wanted to go to another prosecutor outside. Is that what you worked on? It failed in Congress. Just, just by a handful of votes. And I think, you know, it's time to revisit that. Because here's the issue, Marvin. You have 14,400 uh, commanders across the military. Of those, only 400 have the convening authority. So the vast majority, 14,000, were like I was as an 06. And I would, I sent uh, criminal uh, behavior that had occurred in my unit, sent it forward for prosecution, and the convening authority refused to prosecute. What we're saying is that these serious crimes, like rape, like murder, like child abuse, like pornography, these are things that require a trained professional military prosecutor. You know, for those who, who, who point to the essential uh, role of the commander, that doesn't change. That does not change. What the commander will always be charged to do is to protect the culture, ensure integrity, and the fact that the military prosecution decision would be carried out by an objective, independent military legal authority, 
the commander still has the authority to, uh, you know, pre-trial uh, restriction, to uh, expedite the transfer of units, all kinds of authorities. So, so right now, it's, it's the accuser's commander who is adjudicating whatever the case is instead as, of an independent prosecutor. As one survivor put it, Marvin, they said, you know, it would be like if my brother raped me and my dad had to decide what to do. It's an inherent conflict of interest. And the trust level that you identified and that Senator McSally and all, all of us who have been involved with this know is so critical, the trust would actually go up knowing that a trained military legal prosecutor was, was, was reviewing the evidence. By coming forward the way she did, as courageous as she was to, to reveal everything she did before uh, the Senate committee this past week, do you feel her voice has been so loud that it will bring about some change? I do. I really do. I think this, to see her there knowing that she was the first woman pilot in combat, that she told her story and joined the voices of the survivors. And the courage she demonstrated has been matched now by the outrage. And that's important. Mm. Of course, the Twitterverse, you know, they do what they do. But overwhelmingly, the support for redressing, re-looking, re-evaluating uh, this issue, it's upon us. Over the last six years, I will say, the military has made close to 20 major policy changes that really stemmed from the invisible war as this came to light. But the one that remains so important has to do with the very fabric of trust in who evaluates the evidence. As a veteran of the military, what is the primary recommendation you would make at this moment? I, listen, I would welcome this as an opportunity to bring back uh, a thorough assessment of the Military Justice Improvement Act and to be able to, uh, not as the only action, but this one action would really establish that the Department of Defense is serious about this and wants to leave complex legal actions in the hands of the legal authorities. I wouldn't ask a commander to do psychiatry. So why would we think that a commander can take on the role of a trained legal authority? Well, hopefully there'll be some change coming about as a result of Senator McSally and, and your voice as well being heard working with uh, Senator Gillibrand. Well, thank you yeah. so much, Marvin. Can yeah. I just tell you quickly what's going on here in New York? I, I, we're out of time. We're, we're going to do another program. Talk about veterans' I'll come, issues. I'll come Promise? back. Promise? I we'll, absolutely we'll, come back. I want to hear about the state of veterans' affairs here in New York City. But Sounds right great. now, I say thank you to thank you so much. Marie Sutton, Commissioner of Veterans Services here in New York. Thank Always you. Always a pleasure, Appreciate Marvin. Appreciate your insight. We're going to take a break. We come back. We'll talk about congestion pricing here in New York City. Stay with us. We've been hearing about it for years, congestion pricing, a way to curb the gridlock in the heart of Manhattan, and at the same time, raise much-needed cash for the ailing transit system. It's a controversial issue that's been firing up the passions of those who favor it and those who think it's simply a bad idea. This morning, we hear the views of two members of the city council who don't see eye to eye on congestion pricing. Councilman Keith Powers represents a good part of Manhattan that will be impacted by the congestion pricing. He's a strong advocate of the plan to bring much needed funding to the transit system. Councilman Eric Ulrich is a 10-year veteran of the council. He represents parts of Queens where residents rely heavily on mass transit to get around. He's strongly opposed to congestion pricing, which he feels would be a hardship on New Yorkers. Gentlemen, welcome. Can we begin in some succinct way to explain a controversial issue? How would it work? You are? Sure. Thank you for having us. And before we start, I just want to congratulate uh, my, my colleague here because he just ran a very spirited public advocate race and did very well. And I think he deserves a lot oh, of thank you for that. running a, a race uh, so, so passionately. Um, congestion pricing is an idea that came up about 10 years ago. Mayor Bloomberg raised it uh, to basically start tolling the East River bridges and entry points into Manhattan in the central business district to decongest the streets, uh, why it's called congestion pricing. But, the, but also now we're really talking about it as a revenue stream for the MTA, which desperately needs money. How would it work? We understand sure. why they oh, okay. want it, sure, sure. but how would it work? So the plan that's put out today, 61st or so 60th Street in Manhattan, not too far from here, would basically have sensors and tolling so that if you want to 
enter the central business district, you'd start paying a fee to do so. The fees have been discussed, but they, I don't think they've resolved an actual number yet. There also would be potentially additional tolls on East River bridges. That money would then be put into a fund to fund the MTA. That's essentially it. It didn't pass 10 years ago, but it's back up in discussion in Albany now. But wouldn't this really represent a regressive tax? Well, that, that, that's my position, Marvin. It has been for a long time that this really is a regressive tax and would disproportionately affect uh, middle class families and small businesses in the outer boroughs, the people that rely on traveling from Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island and the Bronx and delivering goods and services to the central business district and to Manhattan. The problems with the MTA uh, I believe uh, are around spending, not around revenue. Uh, yes, they don't have enough money to spend to fund their capital program and to fix the stations and to bring uh, all of the uh, uh, tracks into a state of good repair and a signal system. Uh, but that's because of decades of mismanagement. I think that's something that all parties and both people can agree that the MTA has been completely dishonest and dysfunctional over the years, not just recently. And that has led to the crisis that we're in right now. We've been hearing that for so long. But right now the issue is there's desperation for funds. I think they what, $32 billion they need to fix the entire system? Where is that money going to come from? It's got to get fixed. Either of you? Yeah, yeah, Council yeah, no, members I'll, have I'll, an answer? I'll, congestion pricing. I, okay. I, I think that... Um, I think that the, there's a desperate need to put revenue. I actually agree, I agree with Council Marwich, by the way. Spending is out of control, and right. leadership and governance at the MTA is, is So why don't us. you see this as a good source for revenue? It, it, first of all, we spend more than any other major city building new subway lines. The Second Avenue subway line costs billions of dollars more than it would have cost to build in London, Madrid, Paris, or any other American city. It's ridiculous. That's number one. If you want to know where we can get the money from, first, uh, we need to re revisit the idea of the commuter tax. Okay, I don't like congestion pricing because I think it's a commuter tax on the outer boroughs. I have no problem with reinstating the commuter tax that the state once had up until 1998 or 99. It raised hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for the city's coffers. We can direct that funding to mass transit and to improvements in the system. And at the same time, it would be a tax on non-New Yorkers. It would be a one half of one percent of the city's income tax on non-city residents. And that could help us fund the subways and buses and the improvements that we need. Now, the pr congestion pricing plan, if I'm reading the numbers correctly, would generate about a billion dollars a year. That's still only a drop in the bucket where they need to fix the transit system. Yeah, I think that's correct. And I think that that's part of the problem. People are looking at this as the magic bullet or the silver bullet fix to decades of mismanagement and underinvestment. Uh, congestion pricing is one plan. I think it's a bad idea. I respectfully disagree with those who are pushing it. I think there are better ideas to put forward to raise revenue for the MTA. But we really have to take a look at the spending. They are overspending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars each and every year. And Albany has been guilty of raiding the funds. We only recently got the lockbox uh, uh, piece of legislation passed that has dedicated uh, revenue streams for the MTA. Now, would your district and Queens really be beneficiaries of the congestion pricing? Is that, the figures I see is about 90 percent or more than that actually use the transit, so use the subways, yeah, I, not I, cars. I think if you look at it uh, that way, then there's there's definitely an argument to be made. But if you're looking at it from the, the perspective of the small businesses and the people that have to drive into Manhattan every day, they are going to be disproportionately affected by this. And I think it's unfair that we're going to hurt the outer boroughs. Councilman Powers, yeah. do you see any other alternative to congestion pricing? Well, look, the commuter tax is a good is a good option to also have on the table. As you said, we need to raise 32, maybe $40 billion for the MTA. So we need multiple revenue streams. And the governor and the mayor have recently announced other ones that they like to, they, they like to what see. What about the millionaire's tax, which the mayor was looking for he finally gave up on that idea, and he's going along with the governor. Well, the reason I like congestion pricing is because it connects two different ideas around transit. One is funding it and getting money for it. The other is getting people out of their cars and trying to incentivize them to get onto public transit. We know that ridership is on the decline. We want to put people back onto the subways and buses, which are really the economic engine of this city. And um, and we want to declog the streets. Midtown is is, is so severely congested right now. Got to take a break. When I come sure. back, I want to ask you about uh, Council Speaker Corey uh, uh, Johnson's idea of uh, city control of the MPA. We'll be right back.
Back now with council members Keith Powers and Eric Ulrich. We're talking about the congestion pricing plan to generate those needed funds to fix our ailing subways. We're talking about uh, alternatives. There was another suggestion made about a pied-à-terre tax uh, for people who have a second home in the city. Would that raise enough revenue? Is that an alternative, another idea? I, I like the idea as another, it's, it would be part of a plan to fund the MTA. It wouldn't be on its own enough, nor would it's congestion pricing to do everything we need to do to fix the MTA and to provide service to outer boroughs like, like Council Member Olovich's district. But it's another option on the table. I think it's a good one. It's a creative solution. My state senator, Brad Hoyland, put a bill in Albany to do it. So I hope that's part of a plan. What do you think, Eric? I, I think that's a fair point. I, I agree with uh, Council Member Powers. Uh, that would not affect my constituents. Uh, there is no abundance uh, of uh, uh, million dollar condos in Manhattan or, or apartments that my constituents are keeping empty. So, uh, but I will say this, I represent a district like so many others in Queens that are transit deserts, that don't have adequate bus and subway service. That there are parts of Queens in particular that don't have any subway service whatsoever. And so what benefit are they going to get? Even if congestion pricing is passed and this other tax is passed, what benefit, what enhancements are they going to see? We need guarantees and we need transparency when this plan is put forward. There was another idea put up by former Speaker uh, uh, Melissa Mark Viverito that to use the taxes from the legalization of recreational marijuana. What do you think of that idea? I think that uh, we have to smoke out all the good ideas, but I don't, I don't support it. I don't support it. Uh, I think it would be a bad idea. And uh, matter of fact, uh, Jumani Williams, who just got elected the public advocate, I think he came out against it uh, just the other day. Uh, it's, it, I know people are looking for creative and innovative ways to raise money for the MTA because the MTA absolutely needs more money to fund the capital plan, but this is not the best way to do it. A lot has to be done, and we've been hearing about it from you guys in the council, from the legislature. The governor said he'd... He wants to take control of the MTA. What do you think of that idea? He said they need someone as strong as him to take over this system. Well, I have news. He is in control of the MTA right now. And that is... It that is a the, state agency. The yes. state agency. He appoints a commissioner, uh, the chairman, rather, of it. He has a lot of appointees to it. And and by the way, it's it's an agency that does need new governance and new leadership in it. Uh, obviously, you know, the speaker has put out a That's plan. what I want to bring up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Speaker Corey Johnson came up with an idea in his State of the City address the other day, said that the city should take control. The mayor should be in control of the MTA. After all, it's a system, the primary system of the MTA is right here in the city. Yeah. I think it's I think it's a good to have a long-term vision for what the MTA should be. And if we can't resolve our issues in Albany, we can't get funding streams from Albany to fund it, and we're going to get money diverted, then the city should have a real conversation about managing ourselves. What do you think, Councilman? Yeah, I, I think that the speaker has very good intentions, but I'm very skeptical, not, not of his plan in particular, but of the idea of the city of New York running the subway system. We can't manage uh, anything well. I mean, look, look at public housing right now. NYCHA, which we have complete control over, is in shambles. And so I would really uh, take a, a, a hard look at that uh, proposal before moving forward because, quite frankly, I don't think the city would be capable at this point of running the subway system. And just because it's bad doesn't mean that it can't be worse. I think it actually could well, be Well, there are other cities that have uh, turned that way and very successfully. Paris, London. Los Angeles, Chicago, Seattle, and San Francisco. But they, don't, they don't have the spending problems that the MTA has, and the cost, uh, I think, so, needs to be considered. So where do we stand with the congestion pricing issue right now? It's before the legislature, it's part of the budget, the fiscal budget? It's in Albany. It's, yeah. so we, it's in Albany. In Albany. It's in Albany. Let's you just put it that way. You have democratic control yeah. of the, uh, the Assembly and the Senate. Is it likely to pass? What do you expect? I I think that they have to actually define the plan. I think one criticism that the council member and others have raised is we want to see the full details of the plan before. And what is how is his district and other districts going to be served as part of the plan? Um, but they're they can pass it in the budget by April 1st or they can get it passed as an individual bill in June. But you, you expect this is going to go through? Uh, I think that since the governor and the mayor are now on board, they, they all of a sudden kiss and made up on this issue. I don't understand what happened, but now uh, they are uh, on the same page. I think it's going to happen. I just hope that we see accountability and we can make sure that we get our investments and our fair share. Okay, so we uh, so often as we say with stories, stay tuned. Yes. We have more to hear on this yeah. issue. Uh, council members Eric Ulrich and uh, Keith Bowers, thank you. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. And that'll do it for our program for this week. If you have any comments or wish to see this broadcast again, log on to our website, pix11.com slash newsclosa. I'm Marvin Scott. Thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, everyone.